believer in Jesus. Uh, we ask you this time that you turn your cell phones off. And uh, Sean's going to open us up in prayer, but we want to remind you that the altar is always open anytime throughout the service. <laughs> Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to be in your house with your people, Lord, to uh, just to share the good news, Lord, of, of your grace and mercy. I pray that your will be done here tonight, Lord, that everything we do bring you glory and honor. And uh, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit move in this place and give us encouragement, give us hope, give us strength. Fill us with a fresh, fresh fire, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Yes. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, David and going to read our principles. And Sean's going to do our devotionals. And Isaiah's teaching the lesson tonight. So let's say if you're here and you're wondering, you know, will this thing work for me? You feel like maybe, you know, the end's nothing to it. You don't know how this Jesus brother is going to do anything for you. Just hang in there and keep coming back, guys. Just try to stay open minded. Where is coming? Amen. Amen. For me, you'll come to where you're at. Bless you, Lord. Amen. 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 I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. Matthew 5, 3. Earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to Him, and that He has the power to help me recover. Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Matthew 5, 4. Consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. Happy are the meek. Matthew 5, 5. Open, openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. Happy are the pure in heart. Matthew 5, 8. Voluntarily submit to every change that God wants to make in my life and humbly ask Him to remove my character defects. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. Matthew 5, 6. Evaluate all of my relationships, offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me, and make amends for harm I have done to others, except when to do so would harm them or others. Happy are the merciful. Matthew 5, 7. Reserve a daily time with God for self-examination, Bible reading and prayer in order to know God and His will for my life and to gain the power to follow in His will. Yield myself to God to be used to bring this God good news to others, both by my example and by my words. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. Matthew 5.10 see myself in this guy. I see myself in a lot of people in the Bible. But this was the demonic man in gatherings. The Bible says that he was living in tombs. Living with the dead. Cutting himself. Screaming. Unclothed. 
out of his right mind. And I, I see myself in my madness, in my addiction, I see myself in that craziness because I was out of my mind. I was living among the dead. Amen. Because we are dead in our trespasses and sins. In my addiction, I was separated. I was alone. Because I, that's the road I went down. And that's where it takes you to. And that's exactly where the enemy wants you. Is separated. Isolated. Because you're an easy target. You're easy. When you don't have a support group. When you don't have somebody to encourage you. When you don't have somebody to lift you up. You're, a, you're an easy prey. But it says... When Jesus got off the boat and the guy saw Jesus. When he saw Jesus. You know, I, I'd heard about Jesus many times in my life. I'd, I'd heard Bible stories and I'd heard people tell me about Jesus. But until I had an encounter with Jesus. Until I saw Him. Amen. Amen. As restored. As Savior. As Deliverer. Yes. For who He really is. The Son of God. Yes. The life giver. The one who can turn it around. The one who can flip the script. Right? The way maker. The chain breaker. Right? Amen. We know, we know who we're talking about. Yeah. You see, sanity is Jesus. Jesus is the cure. Amen. And Jesus, it says that in just a few minutes, the guy's in his right mind. He's clothed and he's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Jesus is the cure. He will bring you to sanity, Amen. to peace, peace of mind. Peace of heart. Amen. Peace. Not like the world gives, Amen. but like He gives. Yeah. Peace for your soul. Amen. Problems, yeah, we're going to have problems, but they don't, they don't beat me down. They don't push me down like they used to. I, don't, I see a problem with hope now instead of every little problem thinking about suicide. Amen. That's the sanity I'm talking about that Jesus gives us. So, we all have insane issues. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> we all have insane issues. Whether it's, uh, you know, just problems. Everyday problems, marriage problems, hurts, hang-ups, habits, you name it. But if we'll bring them to Jesus, not talk about them, not let them grow, let them fester, but bring them to Jesus and allow Him to do His will, His work in them, He can bring insanity to sanity. Amen. But it's only Him. And He doesn't... He doesn't, it's, it's more than just bringing it to Him. It's allowing Him to work in you. Trusting Him enough to follow Him. Even in the darkness. I think about the woman in, at the well that He went to meet. She was living in sanity. She had been with five different men and the one she was with now wasn't even her husband. It was insanity. She was seeking after a relationship that men, mere, mere mortal men, would never fulfill. It is the relationship with Christ Jesus that sets us straight. Amen. And in both counts, they went back and said, Let me tell you about a man named Jesus. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Amen. <laughs> went back to those areas, there was great revivals. Amen. We have had a young man 
scheduled to come and speak at the end of this month. And I was talking to Mark Halcom. I said, I heard this guy speak once before. I'm, I'm excited. He said, you guys will take him off. I said, what? EOD. Bless you, Lord. Gary and Kyle, will you stand up? Will you turn around, let them read your shirts? This is our motto here at Celebrate Recovery. He took my mess and made it a message. Amen. Yeah. Okay. He took my mess. It's no longer mine. I'm not going to live in it, and I'm not going back to it. Amen. This yeah. is my message that He will save you. He will deliver you. Yeah. He will bring you out. Amen. But you better not go back to it because it will kill you. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. The devil ain't playing. I don't know where we get off and think we can just pray a prayer and not be obedient to the Lord and Master, the one who saved us, and stay away from those things that will kill us. Follow Jesus. Do what He wants us to do and we will find success. We will be able to celebrate recovery. We will be able to share a message that will bring people to Jesus by our life. By our life. That's, that's the devotion I have. It goes along with our message, our lesson tonight. We are blessed and highly favored with the children's choir going to sing a song for us tonight. The praise team is going to lead us in worship. And I just want to encourage you. We've all got issues. Yes. I got a t-shirt that says, I got issues, but I celebrate recovery. Yeah. Yeah. That's, not who define, that's not what defines me. That's not who I am anymore. Yeah. I am a child of the King. I've been forgiven and I've been set free. Yeah. It would be insane to go back to what He set me free from yeah. and get tangled back up with it. Okay? It would be insane. We're looking for sanity. We're looking for hope. And it's in Jesus. These altars are open if you need prayer. If you want to, you know, at any time, these altars are open. We love you. Let's, let's get this party started. All right.
Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. And all of a sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your afflictions are for me. Oh, oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us Jealous for me. Yeah. Oh. Close like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions, he dips my glory in a ring. Perfections are for me. He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. He is our portion. He is our prize. John to redemption. By the grace in his eyes, in his grace, is an ocean we are sinking. Temple beats are like an awful sea, piercing my heart, turns violently inside of my chest.
So, uh, as a result of admitting our powerlessness in principle one, we can move from chaos to hope in principle two. Okay, so principle one is we admit that we're powerless. Right? We, we admit that we have no power. Okay? When we finally admit that, that does something inside of us. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, going. Lord. I'm going. All right. So we talked about hope in the last teaching. And Tony did an absolutely amazing job with that teaching, by the way. Hope comes when we believe that a power greater than ourselves, that's Jesus Christ, Amen. can and will restore us. Amen. Okay. Now, I know we say that a lot, right? A power greater than ourselves. Have you stopped to think about what that means? A power greater than you? Huh. Right? It's one of those things we talk about a whole lot, but have you really thought about what it means that a power is greater than us? Okay? Now, this may seem obvious, but God is more powerful than you. He's more powerful than me. Amen. And it's easy to say, but it's harder to live that out Come in on. such a way that proves that we believe He really is more powerful than us. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so we had to believe that this power... And by the way, <laughs> I've said this before. But when you think of power, I don't care. You can imagine the most powerful thing in the world. Okay? You, and, and then you can times that 
by a thousand times. And whatever you think of as power, multiply it a thousand times, that does still not equal God's power. Amen. Just, just for the record. Alright? So, when we're saying that He is more powerful than us, we need to understand we don't have any clue what God's power really is. Amen. We have no clue. I've heard people say, oh, I wish I could be there at creation when God said, let there be light. And there was light. I don't know that I would have wanted to be there. There was nothing, Pastor. Nothing. There, there, there was nothing in existence. And God said, let there be light. He, he didn't form it with His hands. Right? He didn't, he didn't come up with a great blueprint and design for what light should be. He just said, let there be light. And out of nothing, light had to come roaring out of nothing at 192,000 miles per hour. I don't know that I would have wanted to be there when that happened. But... So He's more powerful and greater than us. But we also have to believe that He can and will restore us. Yes. Yes. A lot of people believe He can. It's another thing entirely to believe that He will. That He is willing to restore us. You know, I, I, I can say that because, man, I used to believe that. Well, I know God is able... I just don't know if he's willing. I just, I just don't know if he wants to do that in my life. Come on. See, there's something that begins to change. There, there is a hope that comes into us. I'm not trying to get on Tony's message, but, but there's a hope that comes into us when we believe that God is willing yeah. to change us. Yes. Not just able, but he wants to. Jesus can provide power where we were powerless. Amen. Right? And every one of us, if you found yourself in addiction or if you found yourself in any kind of sin, not, not even just addiction, but you know what it is to be powerless. Man, I do. Amen. I quit about a million times. Come on. Amen. Oh, I'm done with it. I'm done with it. Oh, this is the last time I'm done with it. And, oh, you know, don't, don't offer that to me anymore. But then the next time they offered it, oh, yeah, you know, I think I will. Yep. Yep. Come, on. Come on. Yep. I was powerless. That's why I needed someone more powerful than me. Amen. 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 And Jesus can provide that power. When we are powerless. He alone can restore order and meaning to our lives. I'm going to say that again. He alone, Jesus alone, can restore order and meaning to your life. Amen. He alone is the one that's able to do that. Your spouse won't do it. Your job won't do it. Your kids won't do it. Mommy and daddy won't do it. Grandpa and grandma won't do it. Yeah. Jesus alone is the one who Amen. is able to restore order and meaning to your life. Yeah. And I know, listen, maybe you don't know about this whole Jesus thing. You know, uh, we're in church. we got to talk about Jesus. Listen, I don't talk. If Jesus didn't work, I wouldn't talk about Jesus. Come on. Yeah. Man, yeah. that's right. That's, the more. Yeah. that's just the reality. If it was not Jesus that radically transformed my life, I wouldn't talk about Him. Come on. Amen. But when I get up and I tell you Jesus is the only way for you to be delivered, when, when I tell you that Jesus is the only way for you to be set free, it's because I walked that path. I tried every way except for Jesus. Jesus was a literal last resort for me. When he should have been the very first one I ran to. Yeah. I'd have saved myself a whole lot of heartache yeah. and a whole lot of trouble yeah. if I just would have ran to Jesus. Yeah. Jesus alone can restore us to sanity. That's our topic tonight. Sanity. And that's kind of a loaded word, isn't it? Sanity. Sanity. 
Ah, oh, you saying I'm insane? Yeah. I'm not saying that, but <laughs> insanity, you've all heard this definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different yes. results. Amen. If that is the way that we define insanity, I think we've all been there at some point. Yes. Amen. I know I have. Do the same thing over and over and over and over again. Well, I did it a million times every time I quit. You know? Oh, I'm just, just go through the motions of stopping. But I never actually changed anything. And somehow I expected that this time it would be different. I didn't change nothing. I didn't do anything different. But I thought, oh, you know what? This time will be the time that I actually lay this aside and don't do this anymore. Hmm? I can look back now and I can say, Isaiah, you were insane. You had lost your mind. Sanity is wholeness of mind. Making decisions based on the truth. Wow. Wholeness of mind. Yeah, when I was in the muck and the mire, I didn't have sanity. I had no wholeness of mind. And I didn't make any decisions based on the truth. That's enough. Amen. And that's, that's what it says. That's literally the definition of sanity. Wholeness of mind, making decisions based on the truth. Based on that definition, I don't know that you can be called sane unless you know Jesus. Oh. Come on. I mean, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but Jesus is the truth. Amen. He's not a truth. He's not one of many truths. Jesus is the truth. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know what the truth is. So how can you be saying? Amen. I'm just saying. Jesus is the only one who offers the truth, the power, the way, and the life. Amen. He's the only one that does. He's the only one that does. We live in a world where they are trying to say that there are many truths. You'll hear phrases like, well, that's your truth, but, but my truth is different. <laughs> that's that's your truth. It's okay for you to believe your truth. But I got my own truth. No, you don't. No, you don't. There's one truth. One. That's it. And it's Jesus. He is the truth. You'll not find truth apart from Him. So if we think about insanity, insanity in this way, I think it becomes obvious that all of us have had moments where we weren't sane. I've certainly had moments where I did not have wholeness of mind. I can tell you that. Just ask my kids. So how does God restore us to sanity? One of the things that we find, and this is really a constant through recovery, uh, we find that God has His part, but we also have our part. Amen. We, we also play a part in our recovery. Now, our part is minuscule compared to what God does, but really, you'll find this all through recovery. This is a... A uh, two-way street recovery is. Uh, let me put it this way. Recovery isn't something that happens to you. Recovery happens with you. I don't care 
how many people are praying for you. I don't care how many messages you hear. If you are not willing to respond to the call that God has to the wooing of the Holy Spirit. If you are not willing to listen to Him and to have a relationship with Him, it's not going to matter how many prayers are prayed for you. Come on. So we have to take responsibility for our recovery. And listen, I'm not just talking to drug addicts tonight. Bless the Lord. I know in this setting it's real easy for, for if you've never been into drugs, if you've never been in, uh, into this stuff, I know it's real easy to look and go, well, that's for somebody else. No, I'm talking to you too. Because you might not have been in drug addiction, but I guarantee you've been in sin before. Amen. Amen. I guarantee that there have been things that you have struggled with that you have not been able to lay down at times. Amen. That you've not been able to walk away from at times. It might not have been drugs. It might not have been alcohol. But it might have been gossip. It might have been lying. It might have been gluttony. Come on. Come on. Come on. Uh. Bless him, Lord. Uh. So recovery is not a passive process something we have to participate in so one of the things that we like to do is uh, we like to take the the word of the lesson and we like to kind of branch off from it so the word of the lesson is sanity and the s in sanity is strength strength real lasting recovery will require a strength that is greater than you. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I'm going to say that one more time. Yeah. Bless you, Lord. If you want a lasting recovery, a real lasting, a, a lifetime recovery, it's going to require a strength that is greater than you. Yes. Yes. That's just the reality of it. How can you say something like that? Well, uh, relying on your own strength is what got you in your mess to begin Amen. with. Amen. Amen. Relying on me and my strength and my power is what wound me up in drug addiction for nine years of my life. That was the fruits of my strength. So why in the world would I return to my strength and like Sean said well that's insanity that's insane for me to think well okay I, you know what I, I've gone on I, I, I've been clean now for you know X number of years and I think I'm good enough to do it on my own now. I think I'm just going to leave this whole church thing. I, I think I'm going to leave all these groups and all that. Why in the world would you do that? You know where that ends you up at. Amen. When we allow our lives to run on God's power, not our own. That is when we find the strength to overcome. Yes. That's when we find the strength to overcome. The A in sanity is acceptance. Romans 15, 7 says this, Accept one another then for the glory of God as Christ has accepted yes. you. So taking step two teaches us to have realis realistic expectations of ourselves and of others. Okay, that's, that's what it means to have a, a sane mind. You have realistic expectations of yourself and of others. We no longer relate to people in the same way we did. We stop expecting people to behave the way we want them to behave. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. 
With acceptance comes responsibility. We stop placing all the blame on others for our past actions. Mm. Mm. That's a hard one. You know how many things I blamed my addiction on when I was in the middle of addiction? There was about a thousand other things that I blamed it on. Amen. Oh, yeah. This person did this to me. That person did that to me. You know, I, I, I grew up this way and that way. And, and I've had this stuff happen in my life. And I've had this and that. And I wanted to blame everything. But then, the Lord began to reveal stuff to me. And one of the very first things that the Lord did... Now, I never walked any of the 12 steps. I never did any of that officially. But it's amazing if you follow Scripture, you end up doing it anyway. Amen. <laughs> because they're all based on Scripture. And one of the first things that the Lord did was He began to confront me about how I used to blame everything that I did on somebody else. And the Lord had to kind of Pop me on the back of the head. Go, hey son, take some responsibility for what you've done. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Stop expecting people to behave the way we want them to behave. You know, I was a pastor for three years. Lesson one. One of the hardest lessons I had to learn as pastor is I could not fix people. Lesson Lord. Uh, I'm sure Pastor Bruce and Pastor Josh, I'm sure they've learned that same lesson. We can't fix people. And not only can we not, it's not our responsibility to. <laughs> One of the most freeing things that I ever had happen to me is when I just began to accept people for who they are. <laughs> I, I'm not going to try to force you to be somebody else. I'm not going to try and force you to live the way I think you should live. You are who you are. Yeah. Amen. If you want to change, hey, I'll be there. Yeah. Come on. I'll come alongside you. Yeah. But I can't make that decision for you. Yes. Mm. The N in sanity stands for new life. Ooh, new life. Man, I love that one. Yeah. Amen. New life. I think most of us can relate to what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, We were really crushed and overwhelmed and feared we would never live through it. We felt we were doomed to die and saw how powerless we were to help ourselves. But that was good. For then we put everything into the hands of God. Yeah. Anybody ever been in one of those situations <coughs> where you feel like you're just going to die? Amen. You are completely powerless to stop what is happening around you. You're completely powerless to change what is going on around you. And you feel completely helpless and hopeless. You feel like you are going to die. We don't like those moments, but the reality of it is if we would embrace those moments, it would lead us to the one who is able. Who, the one who is not powerless, no matter what the situation is. If we would embrace those moments and understand, hey, I am powerless, but I know one who is it. That verse goes on to say, God alone could save us, and we expect Him to do it again and again. Wow. That's Paul. You're talking about a man who paid the price for the gospel. Oh yeah. He was beat. 
He was thrown in prison. He was shipwrecked. He was scourged. <laughs> Even his own brethren turned their back on him. Hated him. Tried to kill him. So I'm sure when Paul wrote, hey, I felt hopeless. I, there, there was a time when I felt completely powerless and I thought I was going to... I think he really meant that. Amen. But then he, then he says, God alone could save me. And I expect Him to do it again and again. Wow. What if we had that kind of faith? The penalty for our sins was paid in full by Jesus on the cross. Right? We're talking about new life. You didn't know that there was a penalty for sin, right? The wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible says. There's a penalty. There, there is a price to be paid for your sin. Every single one of us. I mean, I, I, that's probably not mind-blowing. But maybe you, maybe this is your first time really even hearing about the gospel. But the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. The only way to pay for sin, which if you wonder what is sin, it's rebellion against God. Amen. It's missing the mark. It's missing the standard of God, which by the way, every single one of us has fallen short. Amen. Amen. Not a single one of us, there was only one who ever walked on the earth that met the mark of God, and that was Jesus. Amen. That was Jesus. And so there was a penalty that had to be paid in order for us to be saved. Jesus paid that when He hung on that cross and He shed His blood. That penalty was paid. It's paid in full by Jesus. The hope of a new life is freedom from our bondage. Amen. The hope of a new life. You, Jesus said that behold, all, all, all things have passed away and all things become new. He told Nicodemus, you must be born again. So you, you might be sitting here and like, oh, I, you know, I just don't know about any of this stuff. You don't know the kind of person that I was. Come to the altar and become a new person. Amen. You can come to the altar and be brand new. Amen. All that old junk that you had in your life, God won't even recognize it anymore. Amen. The Bible says that when we accept Jesus, that we actually become the righteousness of God. That's a hard thing to really understand, but that's what the Bible says. New life. New life. The I in sanity is integrity. Integrity. The Lord will give us integrity as we start to follow through on what we say. The Bible speaks very openly about this concept of integrity. It's not an option for a Christian. It's not. If you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to be a son or daughter of God, you've got to have integrity. What, is, what does that word mean? What does it mean that you have integrity? It means that when you say something, you do it. Amen. When you say you'll be there, you're there. When you say that you won't do something, you don't do it. When you make a commitment to something, you follow through with it. If you mess up, you own it. Amen. That's what it means to have integrity. Integrity is something that is inside of you even when nobody's watching. And I can, again, speak from 
experience where when I was insane, I had no integrity. You didn't trust me. I had somebody tell me one time, I wouldn't trust you as far as I could throw you. And they were a puny guy and they couldn't throw me very far, I promise you that. I had no integrity. But something happened when I had this new life that we just talked about. And I had this transformation that happened. I began to tell the truth to people. Yeah. Even when it made me uncomfortable. Even when it made me look bad. Yeah. Amen. Now, I didn't always live up to that 100%. I wish that I could say that I did. But I began to grow in it. I began to walk in this thing called integrity. I had the pastor that I grew up in. He, uh, I was applying for college, and he wrote a letter. And in the letter, he said, "Isaiah is one of the most honest people that I know." And I read that, and I started crying because I thought, "Man, there was a time when nobody would have said that about me. Nobody would have said that about me." And here's my pastor saying, hey, he's, he's honest, he's real. And that wasn't, that wasn't me, guys. Like, I didn't wake up one day and go, oh, you know what, I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> but I had a new life. I had a new birth. <laughs> and suddenly that, that, all that desire all that sneaking around, all that lying, all that manipulating that I used to do. You know why I did it? I was afraid. Come on. Suddenly, I had a brand new life. I had a brand new... Uh, there was a brand new creation. And I had assurance in who I was now. And there was no need to lie anymore. I wasn't afraid to lie. Or, or, or afraid to tell the truth. <laughs> I wasn't afraid to lie. I was, I was afraid to lie. I wasn't afraid to tell the truth anymore. Why? Man, that, that strength came on me. You know, strength drives out fear. That, that power... That one that is more powerful than us, that lends us His power, that will drive out fear. Suddenly they're... Hey, I, listen guys, I, this is probably blunt, but I really don't care what you think about me. I don't care if you like the way that I teach or if you don't. If you like the way that I sing or you don't. I mean... I want you to. <laughs> but at the end of the day, if you don't, that's okay. I ain't doing it for you anyway. I'm secure in who I am in my Lord. I used to get tore up. First time I played piano and sung in front of the church, I had somebody come up to me, you know, you were off key. <laughs> <laughs> Tore me up. I didn't ever want to do it again. Seriously. Now just because I have grew <laughs> and your opinion don't bother me much anymore, Maybe we ought to be careful what we say to folks. Amen. True. You know, I, I was able to mature and get past that, but there was a time in my life where that messed me up. That ain't a part of integrity, but, well, maybe, but that wasn't part of my notes. That, that's in for free. 
The Bible places a big emphasis on integrity, and integrity requires courage. Because it's sometimes hard to tell the truth. It really is. It's sometimes hard to tell the truth. But it's the lies that leave the scars. Yeah. Yeah. Courage comes from power that is greater than us. Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. He is the power that is greater than us. The second T in integrity is trust. Trust. During step two, we begin to trust in our relationships with others and with the Lord. As an addict, I didn't trust anybody. I didn't. I didn't trust anybody. And then there was, and to be honest, I didn't like people. <laughs> I hated school. And the reason I hated school was because I hated being around people. And then a funny thing happened when I knelt at an altar. I, I remember, it sounds silly. I remember literally. I got up from that altar. I knew something had been something had been done. I didn't really know what had happened, but I knew something had been had happened to me. And I got up from the altar and I remember someone was there and they hugged me. And I remember I hugged them back. Well, duh, that's what you're supposed to do. That ain't what Isaiah did. <laughs> Ask my mom. We are not huggers. <laughs> Seriously. But I found myself, oh, hey, that feels kind of nice. <laughs> and then I began to like, oh, wow. I actually, I actually talk with this person and I kind of enjoy it for some reason. Like, that's weird. I'm telling you, I went through school. I had literally about three friends. My wife can tell you. I had about three friends that I hung around and I didn't want to mess with you if you were not part of my three friends. I did. And suddenly, man, something began to happen. I began to trust people. Even, even though sometimes I got burned. Yeah. yeah. Not, not everybody's going to live up to the trust that you put in them. That's true. But the dangerous thing is letting one person fail in you affect you to where you don't trust anybody. That's, that's a dangerous thing. Why do you say that? Because we are not designed to be alone. We're not. I don't mean everybody's got to be your best friend. Don't mean everybody's got to know all your secrets. But especially if you are in recovery... I promise you, you will have an easier time if you get some folks that come alongside you and encourage you, that you can share with, that you can be honest with. If you're struggling, let them know you're struggling. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Oh, the enemy loves secrets. <clears throat> he loves to make you feel like you're all alone. That's why it's dangerous to be alone. That's why it's so important that we begin to trust people. Admitting that our lives have become unmanageable and admitting that we are powerless frees us and allows us to begin trusting people. And trusting the Lord, by the way. Be surprised how many Christians don't trust the Lord. And that's such a strange thing to me. Why would you not trust the one who holds tomorrow in his hand? Amen. Yeah. 
that knows the end from the beginning, that the Bible says can call things that are not as though they are. That seems like the one you should trust. Hmm. So we begin to make real friends. Not just fair weather friends. Do you know how many friends I had lead me when I come to Christ? I had one stay. Literally one. All those people that I thought kind of liked me, even though I didn't like them. <laughs> it's, it's stupid looking back at it now. Again, insane, right? Insane. I was insane. Like, I don't like you, but for some reason I expect you to like me. And I knew all kinds of people. All kinds of people. And man, as long as I had a bag of weed or a bottle of pills, oh, they would rush. They'd rush right to me. When I came to Christ, all but one fled from me. Fair weather friends, guys. We need to get some real friends. Amen. We need to get ready to try and wrap this up. The why insanity is your higher power. That's Jesus, by the way. I don't I don't really much like the term higher power because well the world has taken that and taken it to mean all kinds of things. But here at Celebrate Recovery, the only higher power is Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the only one. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get ready to close with this. Your higher power, the one who is above you and greater than you and stronger than you, Jesus Christ, He loves you right now. Well, I'm not a Christian. I don't care. I didn't, I didn't tack on any kind of condition to that. He loves you right now. If you're a Christian, He loves you. If you're not a Christian, He still loves you. If you are in active addiction right at this moment, if you came into this church building high, I promise you Jesus still loves you right where you are. We began talking like Jesus loves some kind of future version of us. But He doesn't love a future version of you. He doesn't love a better version of you. He loves you right where you are, right at this moment, right as you sit here. Amen. The Bible says, this is Romans 5, 8, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners... Christ died for us. That means while we were in the middle of sin, Christ still loved us enough to come and die for us. And I just want to extend that invitation tonight. If you don't know this redeeming love, tonight's a great night to find Him. And you don't have to look hard for Him. See, the great thing about Jesus, He's got His arms stretched out waiting for you. I've never met a person that was re rejected by Jesus. Never have. And I don't believe I ever will. But I've known many people who have rejected Him. Daniel was singing earlier, Oh, how He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. You'll never find a love greater than Jesus' love for you. And the great thing about Jesus' love 
It'll come find you where you are, but it won't leave you where you are. Amen. 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 So, again, I'm just going to extend that invitation. The altars are always open. If you feel a need to come and pray, uh, again, altars are open. So let's just have a time of, of worship. Kick down, lie to all 
the Lord wants to do something in your life, in my life. He has the power. He's going to spoke the world into existence. Yeah. He loves us. He is for us. He ain't against us. Right. He is for us. How do I know that? Because he went to a cross and bled.